wave. The four degrees that I saw yesterday was on the other side of zero. Because <laughs> he lived in Huntington where they maybe don't get that same temperature. Got too many papers. I'll do this. Um, but it's wonderful to see you here this morning. Glad that it's sunny. Glad you're here. Uh, we're going to be in Acts chapter 13 again today. If you want to get prepared and get in your Bible there, we'll take our prayer requests and praises and read our um, getting to know you papers here today first. I was wondering something. Uh, we need to be praying for people. And of course, the first thing to do is take prayer requests. So you'd like to write these down, pray for each other throughout this week. But I was wondering, like, how many people do we know that have COVID? So first of all, we want to pray for Pastor Suttles because he has COVID. So I know that he has COVID right now. Who else do you know that has COVID right now? Joy Martin, right? Joy Martin. I was thinking of two other people I was sitting back there. And I can't think of who it was. She was like, getting old, I guess. I thought maybe I heard Kristen Hartle has it too. Does anybody know that Kristen Hartle have COVID? <laughs> what? Okay. Uh, all of. She has it. Huh. Her and her son both? Anybody else? Linda. So Keith and Danielle, and uh, you say she's pregnant? Okay. So Keith and Daniel, leader, and Danielle, the lady, is pregnant two months. <coughs> Anybody else? Patty. That's two. I was thinking. <laughs> I knew I knew two. Yeah, so they asked me yesterday when I was talking to, to Terry if we would pray for them. So Terry and Lynn Cornelius, they both have it. And they're, they definitely aren't feeling very well. So please pray for Lynn and Terry. Ian. Okay, I couldn't tell you what you say. Michael. Michael. Okay. 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 Yes, Robert. I think it's the everyone have it as well. Do they? I think so. They've been really sick. I don't know if it's COVID. I'm just assuming it's okay. So Megan and Jared. Okay. To so Megan and Jared Evers. Okay. We'll take other prayer requests now. You want to have another prayer request? Praise all of. Sue Wright. Okay, so your daughter, Sue Wright, in the hospital, I'm not quite sure what's going on. Okay. Bruce.
Okay. Okay, so Bruce's um, almost adopted stepfather, Lyle Edwards, 93 years old, um, very short time to live, it sounds like, and his wife, they both have uh, COVID. Okay. Anybody else? Ian. Can imagine. So his young, that young man's name was Brandon Copenhaver. Yes. Okay. So this young man, uh, 15 years old, correct? Yes. So he committed suicide. So pray for his family and terrible loss to go through that. Donald. I heard about that, I didn't know the name before, but um, former student here, her name was Michelle Reeser, that was a pastor over in Bullsburg area somewhere, but um, this lady's probably 35 or so by now, but her husband, Jeremy Peck, right, Peck, Jeremy Peck passed away from COVID this week, so again, a young, younger fella, I'm assuming they have four adopted children, so tough situation going on there, that's for sure. Anybody else? All of them, another one. Okay. Okay. We'll continue to pray for Bob. Okay. Continue to pray for Bob's this kind of situation. Somebody in the class who doesn't like to talk about himself or mention things, but I'm going to mention it anyway. He can get mad at me all he wants, but Terry was also struggling with some prostate cancer situations and having some treatments and things, so please pray for Terry Starr. Anybody else? Okay, we'll get our two famous students today. We've been doing the famous ones lately, so since they're here today, they kind of visit once every couple of weeks, so don't want to marry and get. <laughs> so we got them today. First, the lady, Marion, married Donald, of course. She was born in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, they have children. Yes, you know they have four sons and six grandchildren. Ben lives in, Ben and Allen are both live in Pennsylvania, I thought. Okay, so Ben lives near Lebanon, I think Allen lives near Philadelphia somewhere. And Stephen lives in South Carolina, in Tim and Texas. They live in Huntington. If you want their address, so you can drop off your gifts to them at 702 Pennsylvania Avenue. <laughs> she went to Bob Jones University. Her degree is in elementary education. And most of you are probably aware that she just retired from Calvary Christian Academy. Not certain military. Her salvation experience, my older brother and I were invited by friends to attend probably in a good way for you guys just did your thing last week or whatever but to attend services at their church we were 12 and 10 years old a visiting evangelist Richard Green spoke on the two roads to eternity I knew I was on the wide road to hell and claimed Christ as my savior that night praise the Lord favorite part of the Bible the Old Testament that is a little bit unique <laughs> uh, have you previously served in church ministry? Yes, of course, many of them, Sunday school choir, Wednesday night teacher, uh, favorite Bible verse, Psalm 143.8. I didn't look that up. I'm sorry. 
I'm very diligent about that. Or Psalm that. Psalm 143.8, cause me to hear thy loving kindness in the morning, for in thee do I trust. Cause me to know the way wherein I should walk, for I lift up my soul unto thee. Good. Um, famous preachers that she's heard, Bob Jones Jr. and Bob Jones III, Ian Paisley. Wow. Siles Fox. I'm not sure I know who that is. Silas Fox. Okay. John R. Rice, you heard John R. Rice? Wow. And Peter and Pete and Bill Rice and Lester Roloff. I guess we're telling ourselves sometimes. <laughs> we tell what we've heard, don't we? That's, that's good. Uh, favorite thing to do, hiking and kayaking. Um, favorite food, butter pecan ice cream. <laughs> Sounds like Patty. She likes ice cream, but not with nuts. Do you enjoy pets? No pets at our house, but I love cats. Are you average, neat freak, or whatever? She says, average plus. Have you had COVID? No, but now, yes. So this was on October the 24th, so we'll change that to a yes. You didn't get 100 now, Mary, and I had to cross all your answers. <laughs> what is your favorite place on earth with my family? Most famous person you ever met? I think it's one of my more interesting questions here. She met Julie Nixon Eisenhower and had her picture taken when she was 14 with her. And family needs the salvation of their son, Tim. So thank you, Marion. Now, Donald, one you've been waiting for. Married to Marion. He was born in York, Pennsylvania. Um, same number of children, grandchildren. That's good. <laughs> same address. That's good, too. Where'd you go to school? Susquehannock, right? Is that the right pronunciation? Susquehannock High School in Glen Rock, Pennsylvania. I'm not sure I know where that's at. That, that southern down like Shrewsbury, down where you were from, down there. Okay. Education, edu ed yeah, education administration, master's degree from Howes Anderson College. Of course, retired from Calvary Christian Academy. He was led by, to the Lord by his, his dad at the age of six years old after family devotions. Um, parts of your Bible you, read, you enjoy most, Psalms and Proverbs. Have you previously served in church ministry? Yes, Sunday school teacher, junior church, bus driver. You still do bus driver. Still do bus driver. Uh, he even does bus drivers for Huntington School District. <laughs> he told me. Uh, where are we at here? Favorite Bible verses, Psalm 3, 5, and 6, and Isaiah 43. 40 verse 31, so Isaiah, or Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all thine heart, lean on to thine understanding, all thy ways acknowledge him, he should direct thy paths. Psalm 40, 31, I don't know that. But I will look it up. Isaiah 40, 31. I'm not wearing any sword drills here this morning. My fingers are too smooth. Hey boys, I got it underlined, but oh, I like this. I used to have this book. I had this verse quite a one on my bicycles. But they that wait on wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall man up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall run and not faint. I like that verse too. Um, first, most famous preachers you've ever heard: John R. Rice, Lester Roloff, Bob Jones the second, Bob Jones the third, and Jack Hiles. Wonderful. Uh, favorite thing to do, travel. <laughs> That's kind of a foregone conclusion. <laughs> Ask him how last week, how many sets of tires he's worn out on his car since he got retired. Uh, sightseeing, traveling, historical places, hiking, kayaking, and visit family. Uh, enjoy sports, follow baseball and football. Favorite food, <laughs> you know you right? <laughs> Patty Rehars lasagna. <laughs> I don't want any hint. You know his address, 702? <laughs> Do you have enjoy pets? Only two goldfish in our outdoor pond. <laughs> the poor thing, they're probably frozen. <laughs> I guess they were maybe alive back in October. Goldfish do freeze, right, I guess. 
Oh, they stay in there in the winter? They stay in there. Huh. Good. Learn something new in Sunday school. Have you had COVID? No, but yes. You still didn't. I thought you did get it. You didn't get it. Okay. We'll let that. You didn't. You're on your way to getting 100 here, Donald. <laughs> Favorite place on earth, being with my wife and family. Most famous person you ever met, Senator Rick Santorum. So thank you, Don Marion. I got backups going here for. So you're on deck, you know, next, next people. So if you don't come next week, I won't read it. But my next ones are Bob Jeffers Jr., Francis Schultz, and Jason Montoro. So you will be next. With the kids, I, you know, I, have to, I can't be sure they're going to come, so I had to have backups. <laughs> Got to teach you about something. That's a lot worse things to teach you about than that, huh? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful morning. Thank you for the sunshine. Thank you for all your blessings and kindness and goodness and love to us. While we are such a blessed people, Father, we thank you for the wonderful love you have for us. Thank you for some of the verses we'll look at here this morning. And Father, you just kind of hit me with the the profound uh, statement that Paul said that in Jesus has preached on us the forgiveness of sins. And Father, what a wonderful thing that we can be forgiven for our sins. Father, you didn't have to do that. You love us so much, you gave Jesus. And through him, we have forgiveness of sins that we believe and trust in him and your grace that you bestow upon us. Father, we are so blessed and so fortunate to be chosen of you to be ones who have heard your word and believed your truth and are part of your family. Father, thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for all you've done for us. Thank you for all you're doing for us right now and interceding in our behalf and preparing a home for us in heaven and preparing to come again. And we pray that that might be soon. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for living in our bodies and working in us and uh, molding us and conforming us to the image of Jesus. I pray today that uh, we would not have the stiff arm out to you where we would resist what you want to do in our hearts and lives but we'd be moldable and pliable in your hands and that we would be further conformed to the image of Jesus today. Father, we we desire that with all our hearts. And Father, so many things get in the way, our flesh, as we'll talk about this morning, hopefully, Father, the effects of sin in our life and uh, we resist you and our nature is so often bent towards sinning. And Father, help us today that we would put those things aside and listen to your voice and have you speak to us and change us and make us like Jesus. Father, we want to be like him. Father, we realize that that's the greatest pathway to success in our lives as Christians is to allow you to work in us. We pray you do that today. Father, I pray you'd meet the needs we have. Father, I pray for Tim Kidd, Father, as Mary mentioned on her thing, that uh, the burden they have in their hearts for many years of his relationship with you. Father, I pray you would work in his heart and continue to do what you only can do in his life, Father. He knows the truth. He knows his mom and dad and his brothers and his families love him. And I just pray that you would work in Tim's heart. Father, I pray you work in other members of our other families. Uh, the Burns have mentioned last week, Father, family members and others, Father, that we're burdened for that, that we want to know Jesus as our Savior and we want them to be in heaven with us. We pray you work in their lives. You'd help us to be a blessing to them. Father, pray for these people that were mentioned this morning with COVID. Father, we pray for our dear pastor that you would encourage and help him today. And I know from the communication I have with him that he's struggling. And Father, I pray you just help him to feel better and give him strength today, give him encouragement. Uh, bless his family. Father, I pray for Joy Martin and uh, possibly Kristen, Father, that's struggling. I know Joy's been really sick. Pray you'd help her today. Father, I pray for the Birch's daughter and her son, for Keith and Daniel. Danielle leader, Father, and Danielle being pregnant, Father, I pray you would heal them quickly and help them. Father, I pray for uh, Lynn and Terry Cornelius, Father, as they struggle, and their family members, uh, Megan and Jared, and others in their family, Father, you would help and bless them. Uh, Father, I pray for uh, Michael, you also undertake for him and heal him. Father, I pray for Bruce's uh, dear friend, Lyle Edwards. Father's 93 years old, an older gentleman. Father, I pray you'd help him today. You pour your grace and strength on him and his wife and just meet the needs and encourage them as only you can. Father, I pray for uh, the Burks' daughter, Sue Wright, Father, and I pray you'd undertake for her and help her. And Father, I pray you'd bless the family of Brandon Copenhaver today. Father, this young man took his life and Father, Uh, such distress and discouragement that people face in life, Father, and sometimes we don't begin to understand the pressures that some people uh, feel 
and uh, realize in their lives, Father, and I pray that you would help us to be able to be an encouragement to others, even as John encouraged us this morning, Father, that we would be an encouragement to people around us. Father, we never know who needs that words of encouragement that we have to offer, and I pray you would help us not to just be reserved in ourselves and be thinking about ourselves in the little world that we live in, but be thinking about others and encourage people along our pathway to life, even those who need Jesus. Father, pray for Bob as he continues to uh, deal with this cancer situation and you grant clear direction and healing and blessing. Father, pray for Terry in the situation with his prostate cancer. Father, you'd help and encourage him this week and give direction and healing and blessing and strength and encouragement. Father, I pray for uh, Jeremy Peck, family father, and you'd encourage Michelle and the children and Father... Uh, just like uh, Ruth Rory's uh, beaver situation, Father, we don't begin to understand these things and the heart, the heartache that they cause and the hurt and uh, the people have to deal with these things. Father, help, I pray. and Pour your grace and strength upon them as only you can. Help them, I pray. Give them the love of Jesus today and your love. May they be assured of that and encouraged by it. Father, help us now as we look into your word here in Acts chapter 13. Please help us to hear what you have to say to us this morning. Please speak clearly to us. Please help us to have ears to hear. Please bless the other teachers here, the other classes and other places where your word is given out in truth today. May you be glorified and may your will be done. I ask this in the sweet name of Jesus. Amen. As I mentioned, we're in Acts chapter 13 uh, still this morning. So I... back there, Acts chapter 13. So I think today, uh, I'd just like to read ver the verse where we're going to pick up here, verse 30 through verse 41, just kind of some time because we're already 15 minutes into class here. Uh, so Acts chapter 13, verse 30, but God raised him from the dead. That's Jesus who Paul was talking about here uh, to the synagogue Jewish people there at Antioch. So, but God raised him from the dead, and he was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made to the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us, his, their children, and that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And as concerning that, he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption. He said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Wherefore he saith also in another psalm, thou, art, thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. For David, after that he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised again saw no corruption. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe are justified from all things from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest that come upon you which is spoken of in the prophets. Behold, ye despisers, and wonder and perish. For I work a work in your days, a work which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. So just to kind of give a summary where we're at here in Acts chapter 13 and Paul's message to the uh, Jewish church there at Antioch. Paul's method was basically to get them to understand that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, the Savior, the Redeemer, the one whom God promised throughout the Old Testament. So he begins in verse 16 and points to Jesus Christ as the culmination of history. This is one we've been looking for. And so throughout God's working as he chose Abraham and God worked for the Jewish people, led them out of Egypt through the uh, desert into the promised land. God worked through the judges. And then at the end of the God's working in uh, in the Old Testament time, God brought, raised up John the Baptist, whom pointed to Jesus, and he said he's on the horizon, he's about to come. And so then he, he talked about the promises that God had made, and that Jesus Christ was, first of all, the culmination of history. Second, one, second point here was that Jesus Christ was the fulfillment of prophecy. So we, I talked through about all of those things, how Jesus had fulfilled Old Testament prophecies. And so in verse 30, Paul says, but God, uh, and, he, and, and how all these things were fulfilled, the promises that God made clear through the, the birth, res, birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And so Paul says, after you had crucified him and you fulfilled all these things that God had prophesied about him, God raised him from the dead. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. This is such an important part of the Christian Christianity. This is a central fact. We, 
We can't have Christianity without the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the dead. Jesus Christ is a, a and, and Paul talks about this, and, and I'm not going to make you turn me off term here. I didn't write this verse down, but in Romans chapter 1 and verse 4, Paul said, and Jesus, he's talking about Jesus, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ's resurrection pointed and declared him that he was the Son of God. He, he was declared by the resurrection that Jesus Christ was God the Son. Don't ever minimize that. You know, sometimes we like to leave Jesus on the cross. And we, we, we think of all that Jesus did for us and his suffering and, and his death and his burial, and we kind of leave him there on the cross and as being a dead Savior, but he's not. He's resurrected. The fact that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead is the ultimate proof that he is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God. And so Paul says that here, God raised him from the dead and he was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem who are his witnesses unto the people. So uh, a lot of things in history is just like, is hearsay. Like somebody said, this is what happened. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is not hearsay. It is a fact. It is a fact that, that in, in, in unlike maybe other situations where something happened and it was kind of like, okay, this is proof of that this happened at this time. Jesus didn't just get resurrected and stay on the earth for until somebody saw him and then zip, he was out of here. How long did Jesus stay on the earth after he was resurrected? Oh, if you said it in a, yeah, you said it in a Bostonian accent. <laughs> I thought you had the right answer, but it sounded like five, but I, she said 40 days. So he stayed here on the earth for 40 days after he was resurrected. How do we know that? Acts chapter 1, verse 3. Uh, he says, To whom he also showed himself alive by many infallible proofs, being seen on them 40 days. 40 days. Uh, so, I, you know, I, I guess maybe that's why I drag it out so long, but I think it's interesting for us. For, who all saw Jesus as he was resurrected from the dead? So I, I kind of looked into some things in, in, in a little bit. So you can name me some of the people, and I'll check them off on my list here, and we'll see how many we get to so Jesus has a resurrection from the dead. I couldn't hear. I couldn't what? Disciples. disciples. So how many disciples? We got several occasions of that. So he was seen of 11 disciples, right? Okay. Okay, so we have that someone. Disciples without Thomas in John chapter 19 verses, John chapter 20 verses 19 and 24. Who else was he seen of? James. James. He's seen of James. Did that surely? He's seen a James. Paul says that in 1 Corinthians 15, 7. He was seen a James. Who else is he seen by? The, yep, that's one of my favorite ones. The road, the two men on the road to Emmaus. Uh, I have a picture somewhere. That I like that saying that says, didn't our hearts burn within us? But you know that picture I had. She's back there taking tennis. You know, where's that? Well, there is number four. Disciple on the road to Damascus. Who was the first one he was seen by? Mary Magdalene. Okay, and also with her was Mary, the mother of James. And he was seen of Peter, Luke 24, 34. He's seen of the disciples without Thomas, and he was seen, the next account we have there in John chapter 20, is seen with all the disciples, and when Thomas was there, and Jesus told him to behold my hands and my feet, that it's me. Uh, how about a fishing trip? Or the fishing trip. Peter says, I go. He wasn't from Pennsylvania because he just said, I go a fishing. He said, I go a fishing. And so they went with him. So there were seven disciples there and they went fishing. And he saw Jesus. And what was Jesus doing when they saw him? He was cooking, cooking something on the grill. <laughs> they gave him a good breakfast that day. I'm, I'm sure they never tasted fish like that before. Uh, Matthew chapter 28, when we get to Great Commission, he was seen of them on a mountain in Galilee. There's two other very famous ones here. We're not going to go on until you say these. Hey, very Francis, A plus for Francis. He was seen the Apostle Paul. Paul says, and last of all, he's seen of me as an apostle out of due time. When, when did Paul see him? Acts chapter, well, we were here. We're not going to go back until we this again. Acts chapter what? He was on the road to 
Damascus, and he was in Acts chapter 9. Paul saw him. The Lord revealed himself unto him. And then Paul says in 1 Corinthians, 13, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in verse 6, was most people that ever saw him. He was seen one time of over 500 people at one time. Folks, <laughs> so the, the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ wasn't just hearsay. It wasn't just a one-time short occurrence that happened somewhere. It's, it's the greatest proof of hardly anything that ever happened in the world is the proof that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And it's a very important fact that Jesus rose from the dead. He was seen in these guys, and Paul says, and unlike some things, you know, I, I was reading this little trial they had in court this week of this guy in Mount Union. That they were, him and his buddy were down there at the cul-de-sac doing whatever they were doing, and the guy poured gasoline or something on his car, on his head, and set him on fire. And uh, so the attorney said, what were you talking about when he set you on fire? And he said, I take the fifth. <laughs> I don't want to tell you. Evidently, it was self-incriminating to tell him what he was doing. But... Uh, Folks, unlike that, the people that saw Jesus, Paul says, and he said, and at the end of verse 31 there, he says, who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. He said, these people that saw Jesus after he rose from the dead, they're witnesses of it. They're not afraid to talk about it. Folks, that's the way that God wants us to be. We shouldn't be afraid to talk about Jesus and who he was. And these people were there talking about it. It's not just like, oh, boy, yeah, wait, that really wasn't true. So we you know, kind of better watch so we don't get ourselves tangled up and get caught telling a lie or something. These people are witnesses of the fact that they saw Jesus after he rose from the dead. And uh, they're living proof that Jesus did rise from the dead. So Jewish people, uh, Jews here in the synagogue in, in, in Antioch, Understand that this is a fact that Jesus rose from the dead. It isn't just something that these Christian people made up. It is the truth that Jesus rose from the dead. And the culmination of history is pointing to Jesus. God gave you all these prophecies that prophesied about Jesus coming, about his life, how you guys would put him to death. But God raised him from the dead, and it's the truth, and it proves that he was Jesus. And he was God the Messiah. So in verse 32 he says, And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made to the Father, Wait unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, that he raised up Jesus again, as is also written to him in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Paul says, I want to declare unto you, and I hope you get the gist of this, it's kind of taking me a while to get the toe gist of this, but Paul says to you, everything about history up to this point pointed to Jesus. God gave us these prophecies that pointed to Jesus. God raised Jesus from the dead just like he said, and I said, I declare unto you now glad tidings, it's all fulfilled. It all came to reality through Jesus Christ, God the Son, when God raised him from the dead. And God preached and he fulfilled what he said he was going to do when he raised Jesus up from the dead. In Psalm uh, 2, 7, he says, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Uh, and basically saying there by that, that you are my son. You are alive. You are my son whom I have begotten and given life to. And your life is an eternal life, which will keep going on and on and on. And then in verse 34, he says this concerning that he raised him from the dead. Now no more to see corruption. He said on this wise, I'll give thee the sure mercies of David. <clears throat> so uh, God raised him just from the dead just like he said he would. And the covenant promise that was made to David that Messiah would come and be through his, through his lineage and through his line when Jesus was put to death, it didn't stop there. God kept that because he didn't allow Jesus to stay in the dead in his body to see corruption as he was there in the grave. And he said he fulfilled that. The sure mercies that God was going to give this mercy to David, that he wasn't going to take David's life for his sin and his life, but he was going to make him the one that through whom the Messiah, the line came. And he said these, these mercies that God gave to David, he fulfilled through Jesus, his son. And wherefore, he saith in verse 35, in another psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. And that corruption is not sin corruption. It's his body didn't decay. His body wasn't in decay. Although, how long was Jesus' body in the grave? Three days. Uh, and how long was Lazarus' body in the grave? Four days. And so they were afraid when Lazarus' body was in the grave, Jesus went up there and he said, roll the stone away, take it away. And what did they say? Jesus, by this time, he's going to smell because we don't embalm people here in uh, AD zero or whatever it was. Uh, we don't embalm people, so he's going to stink, Jesus. We better, not, we better think about this. 
And Jesus said, just do what I said to do. So Jesus' body was in the grave for three days, but it didn't see corruption because he was God. And so uh, Paul says here, uh, in another psalm he said, Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep. And when he basically said, David died, fell on sleep, and was laid on his father's, and he saw corruption. His body saw corruption. So this psalm here in Psalm 1610 wasn't talking about David. It was talking about Jesus and that his body saw no corruption, and his body did not decay. Uh, David's sepulcher was still with them there, and they knew that David's body had decayed just like every other body of every other person that ever lived and died. David's body uh, was, has saw corruption. But in verse 37, Paul says, He whom God raised from again from the dead saw no corruption. When Jesus came out, his body wasn't corrupted. There was no odor on it. There was none of those kind of things that happened to it. So now we get to the third part of this, that Jesus Christ is the justifier of sinners. So in verses 38 through 41, Paul says, Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. The forgiveness of sins. Uh, and that by him all that believe are justified from all things from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. Beware therefore, lest that come upon you which is spoken of in the prophets. Behold, you despisers and wonder and perish, for I work a work in your days, which you shall no wise uh, believe, though a man declare it unto you. The Jewish people, like every person that's ever lived, had a problem. Every person that's ever lived had a problem, and it's called sin. And it's called being forgiven for sin. So what do I do? Am I, am I a sinner? Even, I, uh, even Solomon declared in, eight, in 1 Kings 8, 46, Solomon said, there is no man that sinneth not. The, even the Old Testament people, they knew that everyone sins. We have this problem. God set up that whole structure. I've been reading through the Pentateuch lately and uh, just the laborious thing that they had to go through to atone for their sins to cover them up for a while until Jesus paid for them all ultimately in his sacrificial death, burial, and resurrection. And they knew that they sinned, that people sinned. It was an inherent thing to everyone sins. Paul's declaration in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It's something every one of us has to deal with. Uh, sin is a big problem. If you, if you say, well, I don't sin, you've got a bigger problem than all the rest of us do because sin is a problem. Uh, most of the problems in the world, you realize that most of the problems in the world are caused by sin? Most problems in the world are caused by sin. Uh, I read a, uh, yesterday in the Altoona Mirror, they had an article on the front page about Bud Schuster. Remember Bud Schuster? Schuster, by the way. So whether you like him or not, uh, <laughs> he is 90 years old. Said he rides an exercise bicycle 100 minutes a day and plays piano and does all this stuff. I thought, wow, I didn't know that he quite had all that in but. Uh, but he said his greatest fear is a nuclear weapon getting in the hands of the wrong person in the world. That's, that's a big worry, isn't it? Why is, that, why is that a worry? Because, because of the sin problem. You know, <laughs> why do we even have nuclear weapons? Because we're sinners. Because we're afraid somebody's going to get ahead of us because uh, we, we want this and we don't want them to have this and we don't want them to do this to us. And so we're all struggling with this thing of selfish and the sin problem that we have. But since the bell already rang, and you probably turned your ear off, I think maybe I'll stop here for today. But I want to talk about this some next time, folks, because this is a big thing. When it comes to the point where Paul says, Be it known unto you, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. I want my sins forgiven. I don't know about you. Uh, this has always kind of been a burden to my heart that I can't wait till I don't have to confess my sins anymore, that I don't sin anymore. I it used to be like when I would confess my sins, I would just kind of like, good, I got my sins confessed. Now I'm on to go on to the next phase of the day or whatever. I don't want to sin anymore. I don't want to waste my time confessing my sins. I wish I didn't sin. I ask God every day now in my life. I didn't used to do this, but not that I didn't want to, but I, God, I don't want to sin anymore. I'm tired of sin. I'm tired of my own sin and my selfishness and my wickedness and who I am as a, as a as the unregenerate part of me. I am thank God that I am regenerated, but I still struggle with sin. And I just was uh, listening to a podcast of John McCormick the other day that he's talking about the fact that in heaven, when we get there, there won't be any sin anymore. I mean, the most, one of the most wonderful things about heaven is no sin. No sin. Can you imagine that? I can't imagine living in a world without sin. And it's just a wonderful thing to the Jews as they were, Paul was trying to proclaim to them that through Jesus, you get forgiven for your sins. 
I'd like to go on with this, but I can't. <laughs> I, it's, it's all right. I, I already took three minutes too much, but uh, it's a wonderful thing, Father, because we can have our sins forgiven through Jesus. Uh, we are so blessed to have that. Someday, someday, we're going to be in a place where there is no sin anymore. How wonderful that would be. That would be part of the bliss of heaven, no sin. Heavenly Father, thank you for the day. Thank you for the great promise of your word. Thank you, Jesus, that you are a living Savior, that you were resurrected. There is such great proof of the fact that you are resurrected, you are living, that you are interceding for us. We thank you for all we have in you. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for living in us. Thank you, Father, for the fact that we can be forgiven of our sins through the blood of Jesus. What a great privilege. Thank you for that the prospect that we have of one day being in your presence in eternal bliss in heaven in a place where there is no longer any sin. We look forward to that. We can't wait. Father, help us today that we would have a desire in our hearts that we would be without sin as we face the difficulties and the struggles and the, the things that come up in our, in our flesh, in the world, and uh, from Satan's influence, Father, that we would not fall prey to the sins. Holy Spirit, you've given us the power. Help us to avail ourselves of that power and live victoriously in you and through you. Father, bless now. I pray you bless Pastor Tom as he proclaims your word this morning. Bless the service in every area of it that you would be worshiped and praised and glorified. And I ask this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Thank you for being here today. God give you a great week.